Hello and welcome to NTD News Today. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at our top stories. Shoppers finding more empty shelves at grocery stores. What's behind the shortages and why is inflation going up? You can expect changes and updates to several Social Security features this year. Monthly Social Security checks will go up and so will the Medicare Part B premium and the taxable earnings base. Students are returning for in-person classes in Chicago, but the debate continues on how safe schools are in one of the nation's largest school districts. And across the U.S., there is a shortage of a life-saving remedy for COVID-19. Supply chain issues have been part of the problem, and an industry executive says government intervention has only made the problem worse. If you've noticed more empty shelves at grocery stores lately, you're not alone. Shortages are being reported nationwide. NTD's Jessica Beatty takes a look at what's causing the problem. Shortages at U.S. grocery stores have grown worse in recent weeks. Typically, 5 to 10 percent of items are out of stock at any given time. But right now, it's around 15 percent. That's according to the Consumer Brands Association. I can tell you everyone we meet with, from pet food to detergent, to uh, cereal, uh, they're all confronting the same challenges. Those challenges include surging Omicron cases taking workers off their shifts, weather emergencies impacting deliveries, and high consumer demand. And you've got a combination of incredible consumer demand that has not waned uh, since the outset of COVID in March of 2020. We estimate that demand is up about 11 percent year over year. Uh, that's incredible, right? Inflation is also an issue. Senator Elizabeth Warren asked Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell Tuesday if corporations may be passing along increased costs and at the same time charging more to fatten profits. That could be right. It could also just be, though, that demand is incredibly strong and and that, um, you know, they're they're raising prices because they can. Well, that's the point. They're raising prices because they can and they're not being competed down. (laughs) Powell said the elevated inflation was caused by supply and demand imbalances and bottlenecks during the pandemic. We know that high inflation exacts a toll. We will use our tools to support the economy and a strong labor market and to prevent higher inflation from becoming entrenched. Meanwhile, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg visited the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach Tuesday, highlighting progress the supply chain task force has made in reducing port congestion. One of the reasons why Christmas was not in fact canceled is that ports like L.A. and Long Beach moved record levels of goods. Buttigieg said as long as we're making up for decades of past disinvestment, we're going to see impacts on shipping times and shipping costs. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. And there's a new challenge for the Biden administration. A new poll finds Americans are shifting their focus from the handling of the pandemic to the economy, which is now plagued with the fastest inflation in nearly 40 years. NTD's Iris Tao has more. The hottest inflation in nearly four decades. A Wednesday report by the Labor Department says the consumer price index rose by 7 percent in December from a year ago. That's the fastest increase in 39 years. It comes as the top concerns of Americans are shifting as we head into a midterm election year. A new poll released Monday finds that under 40 percent of Americans say the virus is one of the five top priorities the government needs to address. That's down from 53 percent a year ago. This, as nearly 70 percent, say the economy remains a top concern. And mentions of inflation as a priority are now much higher, from less than 1 percent last year to 14 percent this year. Well, elections are won and lost uh, by the economy. Uh, no two ways about it. Wall Street investor Charles Mizrahi told NTD's Capital Report that the current administration flooded the economy with liquidity, which drove up prices. He says the impact of that will be seen at the ballot boxes. When we don't elect people who are fiscally responsible, who probably never sign the front of a check, we get what we get. Among those surveyed in December, about 85 percent say they have little to no confidence that the government can alleviate inflation in the coming year. He is somebody who is uh, is mindful about being fiscally responsible. And Meanwhile, the White House on Monday said Biden is spending responsibly. That's why he has proposed a, a range of ways to pay for uh, his Build Back Better agenda and, and, he, and why it's fully paid for and 
would still lower the cost for Americans on prescription drugs, child care, and many other issues. This, as inflation fears among small business owners, have risen to the highest level in four decades. That's according to a poll by the National Federation of Independent Business released on Tuesday. Iris Tao, NTD News. Several changes are coming to Social Security benefits this year. If you receive Social Security, you can expect to get more from monthly benefit checks. Let's take a look at the changes and updates scheduled to take place this year. All Social Security checks are going up by 5.9% in 2022. The increase is due to something known as the Automated Cost of Living Adjustment, and that figure is based on the Consumer Price Index for urban wage earners and clerical workers. Due to these increases, the average monthly retirement check totals $1,657 in 2022. That's almost $100 more than in 2021. While the maximum Social Security check for a worker turning full retirement age in 2022 will be $3,345. In comparison, it was $3,148 in 2021. There are also upcoming increases to the Medicare Part B premium. This figure will be deducted from Social Security checks for most people. In 2022, the basic Part B premium comes to $170.10. This is $21.60 more than the rate in 2021. But people earning more will usually pay more than the basic premium. What's more, the Social Security taxable earnings base will go up as well from $142,800 in 2021 to $147,000 in 2022. In other words, people who earn more than $147,000 in 2022 will no longer have Social Security payroll taxes deducted from their paychecks once they hit that threshold. And in terms of the work credits, in 2022, the one credit limit will go up to $1,510. It means you will have to earn $6,040 this coming year before you get the maximum four credits assigned to your Social Security account. The Biden administration is reversing another Trump-era effort with plans to block oil and gas leases in Alaska's North Slope. NTD's Chenny Wu takes a look at Alaska's oil, which has long been a subject of debate for economists and environmentalists. The Department of the Interior announced that it plans to place restrictions on oil drilling in Alaska. The move will restrict oil and gas leases in 11 million acres in Alaska's North Slope. Layla Hughes is an attorney at Earth Justice, a nonprofit that litigates environmental issues. Her organization says Biden isn't restricting enough. What the administration is doing is it's going back to a nearly 10-year-old management plan, which still leaves half of the reserve open to oil and gas development. And we know that the science says we don't actually need any new leasing. Instead, we need to stop leasing. Earth Justice had previously filed a lawsuit challenging Trump's efforts to increase drilling in Alaska's National Petroleum Reserve. The federal government set this area aside for oil and gas development back in the 1920s. It's a strange paradox that the administration is on the one hand trying to boost consumption with uh, increased government spending, which is part of the fact that it's driving up uh, prices right now. And then at the same time, they're trying to restrict production. Brent Bennett is a policy director at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. He says restricting production during rising demand will result in higher prices as well as increased foreign production. You might see um, more production in the Russian Arctic instead of the U.S. Arctic. If we, if we don't produce our Arctic resources, that's a likely outcome. Alaska's economy is tied heavily to its oil industry. Chenny Wu, NTD News. The Omicron surge and the hospitalizations that followed have thrown a wrench into a lot of Americans' lives. They've had to cancel travel plans, entertainment venues have closed, it's upended normal schooling for students and teachers, and made it difficult for workers to go back to the office. Omicron now accounts for over 98% of all new virus cases in the U.S. That's according to what the CDC said on Tuesday. And on Monday, the country reported over 1.3 million new infections. That's according to Reuters. And as cases surged in Washington, D.C., residents sought out free rapid tests that the local government was offering through the public library. One resident who had hoped to return to the office this month shares her point of view on this spike in cases. I mean, it's it's overwhelming and it's stressful and 
I think it's just helpful to try to keep things monitored. And, you know, I, I know our office, we were like all geared up to ready to go back in after the new year. Um, and this has definitely changed things. So it stinks that there's a curveball, but it's exciting that there's more access to tests now. And also in D.C., the U.S. Capitol Police Chief spoke before a House committee on Tuesday. He said his police force has a long way to go before they can reopen the campus. He also said there are two things they need before they can fully reopen the Capitol. More time and more staff. And lawmakers questioned the sergeant at arms of the House of Representatives. He said the security risk for the House side of the Capitol is COVID-19. Representative Herrera Butler's because of COVID. So okay. I, I'm so responsible for security. And to me, COVID is a security risk that we're not going to take. The, the, the okay. Earl Monaghan has made it clear to me that it is not safe to open the Capitol to every, you know, the COVID challenge is just too big. And now we look at the challenge in the Supreme Court to Biden's vaccine mandate. There, Justice Neil Gorsuch was quoted saying, the flu kills, I believe, hundreds of thousands of people every year. Then the Supreme Court quietly updated the transcript on Monday to take out the word of. Now it says, the flu kills, I believe, hundreds, thousands of people every year. The justice stated those numbers to draw a comparison between OSHA mandating vaccines for the flu versus for COVID. On average, the flu kills about 36,000 Americans per year, according to data from usafacts.org. Therefore, on average, COVID is about 10 times more lethal than the flu. The assistant speaker of the House, Catherine Clark, says fines alone are not enough. Now she's calling for her maskless colleagues to be put into isolation boxes. Even if those were to be used, unmasked representatives would still have to pay a fine. And Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell pointed out that amid the surge, more people are wearing masks, but says he doesn't advocate a one-size-fits-all approach to mask requirements. Now we look at a COVID-19 remedy called monoclonal antibodies, or MAB for short. They are basically antibodies made in a lab, and they can potentially be life-saving. But this treatment is in short supply in many areas in the U.S., including but not limited to Connecticut, Nevada, and Ohio. So I spoke with a CEO in the pharmaceutical supply chain business. His name's Michael Einhorn, and he runs DealMed. He says there are a lot of reasons for the shortage of MABs, but he says government intervention is a main driver. The supply chain issues have several different layers of problems, one on top of the other. But the way it's happening right now, the way the products are being distributed right now, relying on the government to determine who gets what, and that process can be very lengthy in terms of time. And oftentimes you have surpluses in certain areas, not enough in other areas. And the markets do what they do best. They figure out where the demand is. And so the process that we have now, which is practically a government takeover of these products, is not the solution and isn't working. Why is there a government takeover? Uh, that's a very tricky question. I can't tell you why they decided to get involved, uh, but since the pandemic and even going back into the previous administration, there's been a lot of government intervention. I think many people in the public today, believe sir? that government intervention often is the solution. Um, we're seeing it isn't, uh, and, and I don't think that's the best way to go about uh, uh, issue like we're dealing with now with these shortages of these critical drugs. Can you explain a little bit more on what it would look like for the market to determine where the supply is going? Well, th there's a couple of different things that would happen. Uh, by default, people who need the product would say, I need the product and I need this many here and you would send them that many here and that many there. Uh, and if they have oversupply, they wouldn't order more. The problem is, is nobody's going to say no to the government. If the government's giving out these products and somebody's able to get a hold of, let's say for the purpose of this conversation, 50 vials, then I can say, oh, don't send it to me. Sure, send it. It's free, practically, right? So I, I think by just by that mismatch, just by that alone, you have product going in places where it shouldn't, and you have product that's needed that isn't going to where it's needed. And how would a free market system look different? A free market system would fill the supply and demand curve the way the supply and demand curve should be filled. So again, if you have a need, you would express your need and the market will fill that need. The way it is now is the need is determined by the government. 
And so when the government determines a need, what's going to happen is, is they're going to descend to that need, even though the need may or may not be there. And so what ends up happening is the supply chain becomes even tighter because if you're by mistake sending products to where it's not needed or where the government thinks it's needed, there's not going to be enough. Back in September, the Department of Health and Human Services set the rules on how monoclonal antibodies would be distributed. That came at the cost of allowing states or doctors to order them directly. Neither HHS nor the Biden administration immediately responded to NTD's question as to why that is. Students in Chicago are returning to in-person classes. This ends a week-long teacher's walkout over COVID-19 fears in one of the largest U.S. school districts. The Chicago debate reflects a larger divide among Americans over whether it's safe to go back to school, as the country reports over a million new coronavirus infections almost every day. Teachers began pushing for more rigorous school safety measures and online learning last week, a walkout which took nearly 350,000 students out of class. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot announced Tuesday the school district had reached an agreement with the teachers' union on more stringent safety protocols to let kids get back to the classroom. Parents like Michelle Egan welcomed the news. I've read the data, I've read the articles, and I read the CDC guidance. And, you know, and those are the facts that help me feel comfortable as a parent that it is okay to send my daughter back to school. And, you know, the fact that I've also... Um, made sure she's vaccinated. Other parents remain skeptical. Brenna O'Brien co-organizes CPS Sick Out, which supports keeping kids out of school for the time being. The in-person conditions right now are not safe. We know that the air filters are not being changed. We know that the kids don't have the right N95 masks. We know that a lot of schools don't even have the cleaning supplies or running water in their bathrooms to be able to wash their hands. So. Just to be clear, four out of five teachers in my school in a single grade are out in quarantine. While most U.S. public school districts have reopened for the new year, some have faced severe staff shortages due to the surging Omicron variant. That's delayed some districts' reopening plans and prompted a return to online instruction. The White House has a plan to keep kids in classrooms by expanding access to COVID tests. Today, the Biden administration announced it will provide an additional 10 million free COVID tests to schools every month, more than double what schools received last year. The program targets students from kindergarten through grade 12. The administration says it also plans to send states billions of dollars to set up testing programs at schools and set up so-called surge testing sites in hard-hit communities. Aid is pouring into the victims of a deadly apartment building fire that killed 17 people in New York City. Crews are working to clean the building from the fire's devastation, and nearby residents are delivering supplies. People looking to help also delivered aid to a nearby Gambian youth organization. Among the dead were children from the African nation of Gambia. Fire officials say a malfunctioning electric space heater started the fire Sunday. Flames damaged only a small part of the 19-story building, but smoke poured through the building after escaping residents left their apartment door open. Spring-loaded hinges that should have closed the door automatically didn't work. A second door left open in a stairwell sucked deadly smoke upward and blocked residents from escaping. Federal safety regulators at the Consumer Product Safety Commission have opened an investigation into the space heater. Three men and two women are now in custody in the death of an off-duty LAPD officer who was shot and killed Monday. Police say Officer Fernando Arroyos and his girlfriend were house hunting when three men tried to rob them. He told his girlfriend to run while he exchanged gunfire with the suspects. Arroyo was wounded and later died at the hospital. L.A. Police Chief Michael Moore said Arroyos was 27 years old and was only three years into a promising career. No charges have been filed against the suspects. An unusual swarm of earthquakes is hitting the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. The strongest quake had a magnitude of 6.8. It hit the region today in the middle of the night. An hour later, there was another strong quake at magnitude 6.6. Dozens of aftershocks followed in the morning. Natalia Rupert, a seismologist at the Alaska Earthquake Center, said it was a very unusual and energetic swarm of earthquakes. This map from the Alaska Earthquake Center shows the location and scale of the quakes. 
The red dots represent earthquakes in the past 24 hours. The yellow dots represent earthquakes in the past two weeks. The region is sparsely populated and didn't report any damage. The U.S. Coast Guard pulled 176 Haitians from an overloaded wooden sailing vessel as it approached the Florida Keys. The rescue effort unfolded after a border protection flight crew spotted the 60-foot vessel some 25 miles from the Bahamas. The rescue crew provided personal floating devices to those on board the boat. Officials say the overloaded sailboat didn't have basic life-saving equipment or navigation lights. The Coast Guard crew worked with law enforcement to take the people into custody. Ten were brought to a hospital with symptoms of dehydration. A Customs and Border Protection spokesman says the group of Haitians will be processed for removal proceedings and transferred to Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. The Coast Guard routinely returns people intercepted at sea to their country of origin. Coast Guard crews have rescued 557 Haitians since October. A federal judge ruled that the Federal Trade Commission can proceed with an antitrust lawsuit against Facebook's parent company, Meta. That's after the case was dismissed last summer. A District of Columbia judge says the FTC's first complaint stumbled out of the starting blocks and was unsuccessful. But the court left the door open for the agency to amend the complaint and try again. The judge says there are now enough alleged facts to bring the case forward. The judge also says that Meta's acquisition of WhatsApp and Instagram also make a case for anti-competitive conduct. Meta says the complaint should be invalidated because the FTC chair prejudged Meta's guilt. Meta also told tech news website The Verge that their acquisition of WhatsApp and Instagram is good for competition and the people who use the services. Still to come, tennis star Novak Djokovic says there was a mistake on the visa form for his entry into Australia. The country may still deport him before the competition begins. And 20-time Grand Slam winner Rafael Nadal is meeting with young tennis players. He's passing on some of his valuable life lessons ahead of next week's Australian Open. More on that here on NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, the CEO of MyPillow. Cancel culture has not only affected myself and MyPillow, but millions of you out there. My employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you for all of your support. At MyPillow, we not only have pillows, but we have hundreds of products, including my new slippers, bathrobes, sleepwear, and my new beds. We're offering the best gifts ever for the best prices ever. For example, we have this exclusive offer on the standard size my pillows, regularly $69.98, now only $19.98 with your promo code. We also have the queen size my pillows, regularly $79.98, now only $24.98 with your promo code. And we have the king size, regularly $89.98, now only $29.98 with your promo code. So go to MyPillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1-800 number below to receive this exclusive offer. Novak Djokovic admitted today that an incorrect answer was made on his Australia entry forms. The world number one tennis star's visa is still in doubt as government officials now consider whether to deport him over the air. 
Giving false or misleading information is an offence carrying a maximum penalty of 12 months in prison and a fine of up to $4,730. It can also lead to the cancellation of the offender's visa. Djokovic said his travel declaration was filled in by his support team, who made an administrative mistake. The team member ticked the no box in response to whether he had travelled elsewhere in the 14 days before arriving in Australia. Questions arose about the Serbian star's movements when social media posts appeared to show him in Belgrade less than two weeks before he headed to Spain and then on to Australia. In a post on his Instagram account, he said, quote, This was human error and certainly not deliberate. We are living in challenging times in a global pandemic and sometimes these mistakes can occur. The player also apologises in his statement for attending an interview and photo shoot on December the 18th, the day after he said he learned he had tested positive for COVID-19 for the second time. Djokovic was only released from Melbourne's immigration detention on Monday after being held there for several days. Officials had revoked his visa amid questions over his medical exemption for a requirement to be vaccinated against COVID-19. That decision was quashed by a judge on Monday who called the cancellation of his visa unreasonable. The tennis star now faces the possibility of having his visa revoked for a second time, just days before he's due to defend his title at the Australian Open. And Australians are reacting to Djokovic's recent moves. Some say he should leave, while others just want to see him play. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. If he's saying that he's filled out the form wrong, then um, you know, can't be one rule for one and one for the other when we've all been made to have a vaccination to keep our jobs. And then someone comes in on an exemption. Doesn't seem really fair. I think Rafa summed it up. Residents say his treatment is regrettable, but also pointed to what seemed to be inconsistencies in his story. But it does feel like we've um, uh, stuffed up on our side. And uh, so it's a, it's a bit of a mess. But um, you know, I've seen his statements and um, it does seem that he's been telling a few fibs too. So I think he should just probably go back. The tennis star had not been given time to consult lawyers and tennis officials before his visa was cancelled when he arrived in the country. I think we should give him the chance to correct that uh, human error or mistake, whoever he has committed. And But I think it's good for every one of us to see him playing on the court, right? And uh, definitely I'm desperately waiting for him to just come onto the court and play in front of Australian people and entertain us. That's it. The Australian Open starts on January 17th. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. In the days leading up to next week's Australian Open, tennis star Rafael Nadal is meeting with young tennis players at Melbourne Park. The 20-time Grand Slam winner is imparting some of the lessons he's learned during his two decades on the professional tour. Everybody have doubts, everybody have uh, frustrations, and everybody's making mistakes. No? And the uh, most important thing is about how you react after the, the frustration, after the mistakes, after the doubts. No? Uh, I mean, it's about keep going, no, and uh, I don't want to tell you that uh, you need to be all the time positive and because it's impossible. His focus and determination I think are amazing and just like just being able to sit over there and just watch him on court, it really, you really get the amplified effect of just looking at how he does that so well. Yeah, it inspires me a whole nother level, like it just makes me want to just try even harder every time I step on the court and I, I just, it just makes me feel like I want to be more like him. Aged 12 to 15, these young players are taking part in a Rafa Nadal Tour Australia event in Melbourne. The tour aims to combine the experience of playing tennis with educational activities. The young participants are also able to watch Nadal practice as the world number six gears up for the coming tournament. Home favorite Ashley Barty, women's world number one, was also seen preparing for the game. She clinched Grand Slams at the French Open in 2019 and Wimbledon in 2021. Her new goal is to crown the Australian Open. The NFL is no stranger to branding partnerships with snack foods, but Lay's is taking things one step further. To mark its return to Super Bowl advertising after a 17-year-long hiatus, the potato chip company is launching Lay's Golden Grounds. The name comes from the way potatoes are grown. 
The team indicated on the chip bag contributed a bit of dirt to the process, helping grow the spuds eventually used to make the chips inside. You'll have to be pretty diehard to get your favorite team's bag, though only 200 of each have been made. If you're lucky enough to score one, we bet you can't eat just one. The Federal Aviation Administration says it briefly halted departures at some West Coast airports on Monday, just around the time reports came in that North Korea launched a ballistic missile. A U.S. official says the FAA paused some West Coast operations for less than 15 minutes due to reports of events in the Indo-Pacific region. The official did not say if this was because of the missile launch. The United States condemned North Korea for the missile launch, saying it violates multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions and poses a threat to other countries. The U.S. Indo-Pacific Command assessed the launch did not pose an immediate threat to U.S. people or territory or U.S. allies. The flights were paused around 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. German athletes headed to Beijing next month may be making some diet changes. While in town for the Winter Olympics, German officials warn them to steer clear of eating meat. Linked to pigs and anti-doping rules, the controversy stems from a certain steroid, which some say could put Olympic medalists and their titles in jeopardy. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more of the details. A message for athletes heading to Beijing next month for the Winter Olympics not to eat meat in China. That's the director from the German anti-doping agency on Monday. The agency sent the warning to traveling athletes for fear they might fall foul of doping regulations. Athletes may test positive in drug tests when they eat too much meat produced with clenbuterol, a steroid used to bulk up livestock and produce leaner meat. And anti-doping agencies have long warned about this risk in meat produced in China. This steroid made headlines in the past when cycling champion Alberto Cantador tested positive on the 2010 Tour de France. He blamed contaminated Spanish meat. But even so, he lost his title and was banned from competing for two years. It's illegal to use clenbuterol in animals in the U.S. and Europe. But the drug has earned notoriety in China. Over the years, numerous Chinese news reports have detailed cases of people falling ill after eating meat products loaded with clenbuterol. In 2011, a German doping laboratory launched an investigation into this. Here's its finding. Among 28 travelers returning to Germany from China, 22 tested positive for low levels of clenbuterol. And in the 2012 London Olympics, China banned its own Olympic athletes from eating meat produced in China for fear the athletes would fail their drug tests at the London Games. A Chinese gold medalist revealed an urgent state order on Chinese social media, saying they were banned from eating pork, beef or lamb when dining out. In her post, she further questioned, is there any food safe to eat in China? Cities across China are imposing tougher restrictions to control new outbreaks of the CCP virus, which causes COVID-19. And at the top of that list, the Omicron variant. Two of the first local cases of the variant were confirmed in Tianjin City Saturday. But as the city works to slow the spread, Omicron has already been found in two other provinces, Henan in central China and Jiangsu in the south. The outbreak in Tianjin has been linked to cases in Henan. Within the province inside Anyang City, two local Omicron infections were reported Monday. Officials traced them to a student who arrived from Tianjin. In response, the city has ordered its over 5 million residents to stay at home. A separate Omicron infection was also found on Monday, this time in the city of Wuxi in Jiangsu province. The area sits along China's coast, about 75 miles from Shanghai. The Omicron clusters come just weeks before Beijing will host the Winter Olympics. That's on top of the country's upcoming peak travel season. The days and weeks surrounding Chinese New Year and early February. To rein in the spread, authorities in Tianjin imposed travel restrictions and launched a mass virus testing mandate for all residents. That's amid growing fear that an outbreak in the city could overshadow the Olympics since Tianjin neighbors Beijing. But health concerns extend beyond the Omicron variant, too. A metropolis in east-central China called Zhenzhou is trying to fight off the Delta variant. The city is home to over 10 million residents. It's already shuttered its non-essential public facilities and some public transit services.
And in South China, the city Shenzhen also makes the list. The metropolis links Hong Kong to mainland China and is known for its shopping destinations. Health workers there reported a handful of local Delta variant cases last week. Officials say one of the confirmed patients works for a company linked to the global supply chain and are urging residents not to buy goods from high-risk countries. Just ahead, NATO is holding talks with Russia as its troops amass on the Ukraine border. Moscow has denied plans to attack its neighbor, but officials continued to press for legal guarantees that would rule out what they called NATO's West expansion. And while that's happening, how are Ukrainians reacting to Russia's buildup? The country's reservists have stepped up their trainings, vowing to defend their families and nation in times of crisis. Stay tuned to find out more. You worked hard for your money. You invest in stability for your retirement and your family's future to build and leave them with something greater. The next unprecedented financial crisis, political misstep, or unstable government can depreciate it all away. It was called the gold standard for a reason, the financial preservation of tomorrow. Diversify your assets against inflation, market volatility, and the unknown with real money. Hedge your wealth with the purest form of money, physical gold and silver. Because any currency printed on paper can be manipulated. What's backing up your IRA? Do what you need to do right now to be prepared with the Reagan Gold Group. Visit now rggusakit.com or call us at 866-912-1384. Receive up to $2,500 in free silver coins and a free safe with your new precious metals IRA. Call now. Someone has to find the way to build the Great Dome Completely new, completely original. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shenyun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. The 2022 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com. The diplomatic push to hold off Russia's invasion of Ukraine shifts to NATO today. A high level diplomacy meeting seeks to calm tensions between Moscow and the West. But Russia appears firm in its demand for security guarantees. Here are the details. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg hosted a Russian delegation at the Allied headquarters in Brussels. Looming over the high-level meeting, whether Putin will launch an attack on Ukraine. Moscow's ambassador to the UK claimed earlier that Russia had no intention of invading. He termed the country's military buildup a response to what he called NATO's aggressive actions. It is dangerous for us. It contains a risk of a large-scale war. That is why we need to act, certainly. And, of course, we are moving troops. Troops are exercising. And it is no secret that they are preparing to deter any kind of threat. But Moscow continued to press for legal guarantees in the NATO meeting. The country is looking for members to reject Ukraine's membership and the scaling back of the country's presence in Eastern Europe. Washington had rejected the demands earlier as a non-starter, well before its inconclusive negotiations with Russia Tuesday. A Ukrainian political analyst warned that the Kremlin is using the talks with Washington to undermine trust between the U.S. and Europe. The long-term uh, important objective for Russia, which it uh, also pursued uh, during the recent talks, is that it tries to discourage the United States from arming the uh, countries in the central, northern and eastern Europe. The White House has renewed warnings that Russia will face unprecedented sanctions if it attacks Ukraine. 
Under Secretary of State Victoria Nuland noted that de-escalation is key in security talks with Moscow. We've also made clear that genuine progress can only take place in a climate of de-escalation, not escalation, and on the basis of true reciprocity. That requires Russia to stay at the table and take concrete steps to reduce tensions. Discussions will continue on Thursday in Vienna at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Despite the de-escalation efforts, growing tensions along the Ukrainian border are rattling the nation. A team of reservists has stepped up their training programs. They pledge to defend their country and family anytime from Russian aggression. Let's look at what they're doing. In her daily life, Alyssa Bankovska is a cybersecurity specialist and mother to her young son. But every weekend, she attends special military training activities. I came here to territory defense forces to have skills to uh, use the gun to defend myself, to defend my family from possible Russian aggression. The reservist has been training for 18 months, both in weapons use and first aid. She's also learning military tactical skills from a government program. It prepares reservists to form Ukraine's territorial defense forces. In 2014, Russia annexed Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula and supported a separatist insurgency to the east of the country. Over 14,000 people died in more than seven years of fighting. If the enemy knew that everybody in the country, or let's say many people in the country, have the skills to use rifles and to defend their home, there will be no uh, situation like in Crimea 2014. Another reservist said he didn't know how to fire a weapon at the beginning, but eight years later, he oversees the training. In 2013, for example, when uh, war was starting, I cannot do nothing. I do not know how to shoot. I do not know what equipment I need. Now I think I'm kind of ready to this, but of course not as ready as I want to be. Last summer, the president of Ukraine signed a law establishing reserve units. Around 20 brigades of the territorial defense forces have now been trained to support Ukraine's army. These forces will defend the country's sovereignty should Russian troops mass on their shared border. Canada's second most populous province, Quebec, is planning to force adults refusing to get vaccinated for COVID-19 to pay a health contribution. It's a move likely to spur a debate about individual rights and social responsibility. Residents refusing a COVID-19 vaccine in Canada's Quebec province may soon have to pay a tax instead. Governments around the world have imposed varying restrictions on the unvaccinated, but a sweeping tax would be a rare and controversial move. Citing the financial burden unvaccinated people are putting on the system, Premier Francois Legault said on CTV Tuesday that the tax would likely be up to 100 Canadian dollars, or around 80 U.S. dollars. Those who refuse to receive their first dose. He added that the unfinished proposal wouldn't apply to those who can't get vaccinated for medical reasons. Provinces across Canada are experiencing exponential surges in COVID-19 cases due to the Omicron variant, and Quebec is one of the worst hit. Last month, Quebec said it had no choice but to allow some essential workers to continue working, even after testing positive for the virus, in order to prevent staff shortages from halting health care services. Legault says that even though only 10 percent of the province population remains unvaccinated, they make up about 50 percent of their intensive care units. Whether attacks on the unvaccinated could survive court challenges will depend on the details. Heavy rains this week drenched parts of Minas Gerais, a southeastern state in Brazil. Locals fear that the overflowing water could cause a severe dam collapse. The downpour has brought widespread flooding. Rivers overflowed and submerged local fields, while drone video captured water speeding through Kiro Oka hydroelectric dam. Nearby residents are bracing for a possible dam breach. One of them warned that five cities in the area would be affected if the dam bursts. Others are concerned about disruptions to basic services and transportation. The rains may have also caused a canyon rock face to collapse on Saturday. The accident killed 10 tourists during a boat tour. The rains are expected to get heavy in the coming days, and the city's mayor warned that the area is under a state of alert. Residents fear the worst is yet to come. 
Coming up, UNESCO this week decides whether to include falconry on its list of intangible cultural heritage. The sport is a centuries-old tradition in Qatar. More on that after the short break. Cambodia's landmine-sniffing rat has died at age eight. The news was announced by the organization that trains him. The tiny hero was an African giant pouched rat and went by the name Magawa. A news release says Magawa is in good health and enjoyed his last week, noting that towards the weekend, he started to slow down. He slept more and showed less interest in food. The agency says the rat had done incredible work throughout his time. Magawa is renowned for finding 71 landmines and unexploded 38 items during his career. His official job title was Hero Rat. Cambodia is home to 40,000 mine amputees per capita, one of the world's highest figures for the tra- tragedies. A UK-based veterinary charity honored Magawa with a gold medal in 2020, ahead of the rodent's retirement in June 2021. The rat was born and trained in Tanzania before moving to Cambodia in 2016. UNESCO will decide this week whether to include falconry on its list of intangible cultural heritage. The sport is a centuries-old tradition in Qatar. Entity's Andrew Thomas has the details. These birds are some of Khalid al-Badi's most prized possessions. Like generations before him, he keeps them for hunting. Qatar was traditionally a nomadic country, so these birds of prey were once a way to catch food. It's very important to make falconry a living human heritage because falconry is about human life. The first step humans took when they were created was to hunt, to eat. Hunting is natural for human life. Nowadays, falconry is more of a hobby, but one many Qataris are still very passionate about. Falconry has been nominated for inclusion on UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage. Falconry is not just a sport, it's a heritage. It's a special and sensitive topic for hunters and falconers. The number of falconers today has grown and so has the number of helpers who prep the cars and the equipment for training and hunting. Falconers around the world also use other birds of prey like eagles and hawks. Some aspects of the sport may differ from country to country, but methods tend to be broadly similar. As an Arab man, I feel proud when someone compliments me by saying you are like a falcon, because a falcon is a symbol of intelligence, wit, art, and masculinity. When you want to compliment a person, you say you are free like a falcon. After prayers, the falconers and their assistants start to prepare the creatures. Many of the techniques are traditional, but there are also some modern additions, like drones to carry the bait through the air for falcons to chase. In the past, training falcons was simpler. Falconers were worried about losing their birds because they didn't have the same modern equipment that they have now like GPS systems and trackers. They always went for the simple hunts or the close ones. In the past, they also used camels and horses, so speed was limited. Today, the fast cars and fancy equipment allows for more skill and proficiency. UNESCO will make a decision on whether to include it on the list this week. Andrew Thomas. NTD News. Warming up before exercise can help prevent joint pain and reduce the risk of injury. Let's get a few tips on today's health segment. Here's Gina Marie, who brings us Strong Mind and Body. Your joints may start hurting while you're working out, so it's best to stop and take another approach. Joint pain is never good during exercise, and it can signify two things potential injury or the fact that your body isn't quite ready for the strain. This may be of particular interest as temperatures begin to drop. Warming up prior to exercise can help prevent joint pain. It can also reduce the risk of an injury. It allows the synovial fluid to work its way into the joints. That way they are lubricated and can move freely. So what would a warm up look like? It really depends on what you are doing. If you are heading outdoors for a walk, jog or bike ride, it can involve simply starting out at a slower pace. Take 10 to 15 minutes to ease into it before really hitting your stride. For resistance training, a walk can help. It's also a good idea to focus on the joints you'll be using. So try performing the movements without any weight or low weight. This is a great habit to get into. 
Once you are warm, you should be good to go. Sometimes it can involve things like shoulder circles or lunges. Do anything gentle that gets blood to the area. Warming up before exercise is a good way to avoid injury. Stretching afterward can help also. Stretching before a workout can be dangerous. It may trick the body into expanding its range of motion. That can potentially put it in a compromising situation that can lead to injury. So although you may want to be loose and warm prior to a workout, you want to save the stretching for the end. Stretching after a workout can aid in recovery and prevent soreness that may occur. It will also help to improve your next day's workout. Remember to warm up before and stretch after. It can help protect your joints and prevent injury. If you do feel joint pain during exercise, stop immediately. Reduce your intensity or find alternative exercises. Thanks for watching. At NTD, we're honored to be your source for the news. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.com.